<laughs> well, I think that um, we are not doing that. I think that we are trying to live strong, and I think that there are lots of places in our lives that we need to perhaps uh, reconsider and revisit. So I want to talk about the notion of what positive psychology is and what positive living is from the perspective of what we know about uh, psychological aspects of development and behavior. So I want to uh, touch on uh, a number of topics, each of which I think is a focus of efforts to strengthen ourselves, or, or if they are not a uh, focus of efforts to strengthen ourselves, they should be. So I want to start with one that we're pretty good at, and that is physical. Physical fitness, physical um, health, physical wellness. Physical wellness is something I think that all of us are involved in. If you go to the gymnasium here at Emory, you're going to see lots of people involved in physical wellness, doing strength training and running and jumping up and down and doing all kinds of things. And you see people of all ages, even as old as I, doing things to try and make ourselves physically more healthy. And I think that there's no question that is probably the thing we're best at we attempt to make ourselves physically strong. I think that's where positive psychology has had a dramatic impact. The second place that I would want to touch on is nutrition. And nutrition is something that I think we're also pretty good at. I'm starting with the ones I think we're pretty good at. I go to the store and I see students go to the store here at Emory and if I'm shopping somewhere I see people pick up a product and they look at it and they say, what is the nutritional value of this thing that I'm about to put into my body? How much fat content? How many calories are there? How much carbohydrate? And they look and they put things back and they look at something else. We're so careful about what it is we put into our bodies physically. So I think that we are probably nutritionally well. We have the capacity and we put in the energy to become nutritionally well. So I think in terms of positive psychology, we are doing all right at the nutritional level. But then I come now to the first one that I'm worried about. And I would call this adaptational wellness. Adaptational wellness. I'm an old guy, so I don't have slides. <laughs> you have to listen. Adaptational wellness. To what degree are we working on becoming capable of responding to difficulty? Now, I am particularly interested in this because I've spent about 12 years as a member of the, um, the, the Center at Emory for Myth and Ritual, study of myth and ritual in American life. And what we study there uh, are things like resilience. And we began our study of resilience because we wanted to see what was happening to children as parents were off in the workplace, two parents working in all kinds of stresses of modern life. And we were quickly diverted from this when 9-11 happened. And we began to look at how we as a people responded to 9-11. And I was trained as a clinical psychologist back in the 60s to focus on ways in which we need to help parents raise children without pain, and that we believe that we could possibly do that. Every parent who has had a child born to them has said to himself and herself, I am going to raise this child without pain. I want nothing bad to happen to this child. Every one of those parents failed to do that because all of us have experienced pain in our lives. Our parents failed in that promise to themselves, as we did to our children. The fact is, we can't be raised without pain. Things happen. But it used to be that things happened that weren't so big as 9-11. They happened. But 9-11 happened. We live in a world where terrible things can happen. So the, 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 the strategy for raising children and for living is different now. It's not trying to avoid problems. It's being able to deal with them when they occur. How do we build resilience? And I spent 10 years studying this question, how do we build resilience, going beyond just sort of being and hoping that nothing happens to making ourselves capable of absorbing the kinds of things that can happen in this world, both as adults and as children and as families. 
And the answer, which is a very long talk, but if I only have a few minutes, I can tell you the answer is, and you would not imagine that this would be the case, the answer is establishing yourself as a transgenerational person. That is, learning about the history of your family. Learning about the history of your family and where you fit in to the context of this family, which has, when you learn the stories of the family, a oscillating history. If you ask your family, you will find that they have had good times and bad times intergenerationally. Your grandparents may have had rough times, your parents may have had, but the history of an oscillating family is one in which good things happen and bad things happen. But the lesson from the oscillating family is that although bad things happen, we come back from them. And when we hear the stories of our family, we also learn about heroes in our family which give us reason to believe that we are special and we are capable and we're competent and we survive. And that's adaptational health or adaptational wellness. This takes work. And so you need to see that as something that you have to do just like exercise. Relational wellness. Relational wellness. At last count, I had, I think, about 11 friends. I've talked to people much younger than I am who have thousands. <laughs> and I, I, I feel terrible. <clears throat> friends, the people that we turn to, when there is trouble in our lives, when we need to adapt, when we need to cope, when we need a moment of pause. Friends. Relational wellness means that among all those friends, there are some friends. From among all those people that we are connected with on Facebook and other things like that, which I think are tremendous things that I don't understand, but nonetheless, they are wonderful opportunities to communicate with other people, but they don't replace time with others. We used to have this notion of quality time in raising children. People would say, well, I'm going to go home and uh, toss a ball with my son uh, between my meetings at work, and that's quality time. It turns out that when we ask people who've spent lots of time with children, that they tell us that children didn't differentiate quality time from time. Time with mom, time with dad was quality time. It didn't matter really what the, the parents were doing. Well, time with people is different from time texting people. There's something called an interpersonal reflex. There's something that we have which is evoked when we're with another person. It happens to you when the door opens on an elevator and someone else walks in. If you're alone in the elevator just leaning against the back wall like this, and the door opens and a human being walks in and you go like this. <laughs> I am now here as a person. And I am here ready to relate to you. That's different from me at the back wall. Well, in many ways, relational wellness means exposing yourself to as many situations as possible wherein you're not at the back wall, that you have to look a certain way, your facial expressions have to be attended to, and you have to watch the other person you're with. This is relational wellness, and it's more than friends on Facebook. Ethical, moral wellness. Ethical and moral wellness. We have a certain level of behavior that is based upon some sense of what's right and wrong. Ethical wellness and moral wellness means that you need to decide on the basis of what the outcome of something might be. You need to decide what to do on the basis of what you need, on the basis of what you want, but you also need to decide what you do based upon whether it is good or bad, right or wrong. There needs to be some sort of standard up to which you hold your behavior. And this is not big things, small things as well. We see this on this campus all the time. Students on the campus pr prefer to eat food that's local. We have uh, days at the, at the food court where they don't have any kind of 
materials that are thrown away. We try to reduce our environmental impact. This is a decision that is based upon some standard, good versus bad. We need to practice that. We need to practice that. If we park in a place at a, at a, a mall which is reserved for, for pregnant women, or, is that a good thing or a bad thing? How much of a rush am I in? We need to see that as something that we exercise on a daily basis. Exercise, I'm using that word, exercise, because that's what strengthens our morality, strengthens the ethical uh, capacity that we have. Let me come to this next one, spiritual. Spiritual wellness. Spiritual wellness. I see spiritual wellness as an anchor. I see it as something which provides for us a system of belief which guides our life. Now, I don't believe that we should or can say to anyone, you need to believe this specific religious uh, uh, idea, or you need to adopt this particular religious approach, but I believe that every one of us must have a belief system. Every child must be raised in a family with a belief system. It doesn't have to be a religiously based belief system, but there needs to be a belief system. And we have to see that every single moment of our life is directed by this belief system. And this is, of course, intertwined with morality, with ethics, with all the other kinds of things. But a system of beliefs is necessary. It provides an anchor for us, a place that we can go when something is awry, when we need some direction or stability. I go back to 9-11. What did we as a nation do after 9-11? We went to churches. I didn't care if it was a synagogue I went to. I went to a church. People who were Christian came to my synagogue. We went places and we sat down together with people who had a belief system to try and help us find some meaning in what had happened. So we need to exercise the belief system, we have to be sure that we have one in place, regardless of what it is. Regardless of what it is. Now the last one I come to is intellectual and creative fitness or wellness. Now I have spent a long time, as Franz said, more than 40 years here at Emory. I am really an expert on 18 to 22 year old people. I have known tens of thousands of them. I get older, they stay the same. <laughs> but here's what's changed. They have changed, mostly for the good. They vary, the 18 to 22 year olds. But technology has brought us to a place where we now have the opportunity to use knowledge and have knowledge in a very different way. We are capable of carrying with us an incredible amount of knowledge, an incredible amount of knowledge, but we carry it with us in an external drive. The knowledge that is accessible to any one of us is present, but it's present in a, an iPad, an iPod, it's on a computer, and I first began to suspect there was something going on here when, when I asked a student about a poem that oh, I think everyone, you know, a poem, uh, a plain old poem like trees or something that we would learn when we were kids that all of us had to memorize. And I brought this up in a, in a class and the student said, well, I don't know it, but I can get it for you. <laughs> and yes, they can. They can access it. Everything can be accessed accessed in, in a very, very brief moment. So we don't have to know it, we just have to know where to find it. Now this sounds terrific, but there was a playwright whose name escapes me, increasingly that happens, who described the current generation as pancake people. Oh yes, gasp, pancake people. They are very, very wide. They cover an incredible number of areas and have access to lots of stuff, but their knowledge is very thin. Pancakes. Now, I have taught creativity for a very long time. I have a seminar on creativity. I do graduate 
seminars on creativity. And what I find about creativity is this, that creative ideas appear when the same bits of information that seem unconnected coexist in the same place. When the same information coexists and in some way that can be connected. That's when a creative idea appears. Now what has happened is that the, the ideas are out there in space and not existing in the same place. Unless they exist in the same place, they will not be connected as only a human mind can, can connect them. So I have a new baked good that I prefer to foster, to propose. I know that the pancake is going to be there, but we need something under it that's deeper. So the model that I would propose for intellectual wellness is the muffin. <laughs> it is broad on the top. In fact, in a, again, one of these maddening shortcuts, I think bakeries are selling muffin tops. You don't even need the bottom. I'm saying you need the bottom. <laughs> You need the bottom, because if you have the bottom, there is depth under the, the muffin top. And that's where the creative ideas can take place. And that's intellectual fitness, and that's intellectual wellness. And it provides the opportunities for things to appear that haven't ever appeared. So what I propose in terms of positive psychology is focusing on the things that you need to strengthen, that you actually can strengthen on morality, on relationships, on adaptation, on resilience. And if you could do this, the model I would propose to you for the 20th, first century, fully developed, live strong person would be, and I'll read this out to you, a fit, well-nourished, resilient, befriended, good, and anchored muffin. I thank you. <laughs>